Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome everybody this afternoon for our five o'clock uh, worship service at Perry Hill Road Church of Christ. Um, what a beautiful, beautiful afternoon to come together by this wonderful technology to worship our great God, Lord, and Creator. We're going to begin our uh, worship unto the Lord this afternoon with uh, our first song by Matthew Bruce, and then John DeMoss will have our scripture reading from the book of Proverbs, and then Matthew will have two more songs before Brother Wilking leads us in our first prayer. Let's clear all the things of this world from our hearts and minds as we engage in this wonderful time of worship to our great God and creator. Brother Matthew. All right, our first song will be O to be like thee. <clears throat> O to be like the blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures, Jesus thy perfect likeness to wear. O to be like thee, O to be like thee, Blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art, come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image deep on my heart. For to be like thee, full of compassion, loving, forgiving, tender, and kind. Helping the helpless, cheering the fainting, seeking the wandering sinner to find. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as a art. Come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image deep on my heart. O oh, to be like thee, Lord, I am coming now to receive the anointing divine. All that I am and have I am bringing, Lord, from this moment all shall be thine. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as I art. Come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image deep on my heart. Can you hear me? Yes. Get me right, Proverbs 28, 20 through 28. A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. To have respect of persons is not good, for a piece of bread that a man will transgress. He hath hastened to be rich, hath an evil eye, and considereth not the poverty shall come upon him. He that rebuketh a man afterward shall find more favor than he that flattereth with a tongue. Whosoever robbeth his father or his mother and saith, it is no transgression, the same is the companion of a destroyer. He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife, but he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. He that trusteth his own heart is a fool, 
but whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. He that giveth unto the poor shall not lack, but he that hideth his eyes shall have many a curse. When the wicked men, <clears throat> I'm sorry, when the wicked rise, men hide themselves, but when they perish, the righteous increase. Our next two songs before the prayer will be sweet, will be regarding prayer. The first one will be sweet hour of prayer. <clears throat> Sweet are a prayer, sweet are a prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul hath often found relief, and all escape the tempter snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, the joy I feel, the bliss I share of those whose anxious spirits burn with strong desire for thy return. With such I hasten to the place where God my Savior shows his face, and gladly take my station there, and wait for thee, sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, Thy wings shall my petition bear To those who with and faithfulness Engage the waiting soul to bless And since he bids me seek his face Believe his word and trust his grace. I'll cast on him my every care and wait for the sweet hour of prayer. Our next song will be God Answers Prayer Today. <clears throat> We pray for strength that our desires may be fulfilled, but weakness comes and humbles us to do God's will. We pray for help that we can do some greater thing, yet burdens come. God answers prayer today, but in the wisest way, He knows what's best for us from day to day. We thank our Father for the blessings we receive. Oh, what a joy to know He hears when we believe. We do not see from immersed wealth or worldly fame. We seek Him first in Jesus' blessed name. God answers prayer today. But in the wisest way, he knows what's best for us from day to day. As 
as days grow short and life begins to fade away, yes, we see God's wisdom as he enters when we pray. Our Heavenly Father knows our every care and need. He knows what's best. His will we must give heed. God answers prayer today, but in the wisest way. He knows what's best for us. From day to day. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come before you now so thankful for this chance to get together and still worship you and to learn more about your will. Dear Lord, we know that you always find a way to give us a chance to worship you and to devote our time yeah. to learning more about you, dear Lord. We ask that you will watch over us. We ask that you will help us to focus uh, on you every day and find new uh, and different ways to spread your will and still be shining our light for you in this world. Dear Lord, we are so thankful for everything you have still given us, the safety and the health that we have and the ability to be a part um, and to be home and still be taken care of, dear Lord. We know all these blessings come from you. We ask those things in your son's name. Amen. Our psalm before Brother Bill's lesson is, I am the vine. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. Bear precious fruit for Jesus today. Branches in him, no fruit ever buried. Jesus has said, he taketh away. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. I am the vine, be faithful and true. As what ye will, your prayer shall be granted. The Father love me, so I am love you. Now ye are clean through words I have spoken. Living in me, much fruit ye shall bear. Dwelling in you, my promise unbroken. Glory to heaven with me ye shall share. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. I am the vine, be faithful and true. As what ye will, your prayer shall be granted. The Father loved me, so I have loved you. Yes, by your fruits the world is to know you. Walking in love as children of day. Follow your guide, he passes before you. Leading to realms of glorious day. I am the vine and ye are the branches. I am the vine, ye Faithful and true, as what ye will, your prayer shall be granted. The Father loved me, so I have loved you.
Bill, you are muted. Hey, Bill, you're muted. Good questions that we can focus on and help ourselves because if the Bible talks about anything at all, it talks about peace, it talks about unity. It's always been interesting to me as many trips as I've made over to India uh, over the years and learned a little bit about their culture and about Hinduism and so forth, they do not have a God for peace. And you know, it's one of the ancient religions. It's one of the oldest religions there is. I've often wondered if that isn't why we are introduced to, uh, in, in the Old Testament during the patriarchal period, so early on, we're introduced to God as the God of peace, shalom. A uh, word that is used, and so that uh, that would be something that would be certainly different uh, to the Persian world would be to understand a God of peace or of uh, unity and that sort of thing. So when we think about blessed are the peacemakers and think about what are some of the differences that are here, I found this chart. I wish I could take credit for for this. I I, I just really think this chart is just really a great chart. I, uh, I was just looking for some stuff on the internet uh, to make a background for peacemakers and peacekeepers. And I ran across this particular chart. And I think this chart really does tell us the difference. On the left side of the chart, you have where it has escape. Uh, that is the extreme coming from blessed are the uh, peacekeepers, if we just say that. I mean, what a peacekeeper would be is trying to, uh, somebody who just wants to maintain peace at any cost, at any price, just doesn't want to have any kind of run in, any kind of confrontation at all, and is just going to go along to get along, sort of thing. And uh, nobody really likes conflict unless you're on Facebook and social media, then, then it's okay. Uh, but Nobody really, honestly, that was a joke. Uh, nobody really honestly likes confrontation. At least I hope not. It, it shouldn't be, at least for a Christian, it should not like it. But even among Christians, sometimes there is just a, an unwillingness sometimes just to, to confront things that are bothering them, that are dealing uh, with sin or, or, or challenging uh, something. Uh, because some people just don't like to be challenged. They think that it's... Uh, Somehow, if you challenge them, if you question them, you have somehow insulted their personhood of some way. You have accused them. Of when, in fact, you're just asking a question. I mean, as I said, all you have to do is go on, on social media and see where somebody posts something and somebody asks a question, and then watch the reaction. Uh, of course, the anonymity that's sort of associated with social media in that one can be behind the keyboard and not really be face to face. If those two individuals were face to face, it would not escalate the way that it does. Unfortunately, they don't stop and think about that. So you have somebody who runs away, somebody who blames, somebody who denies uh, on the escape. And then you have on the far, far right side, you have the attack mode, the put down, the gossip, the fighting, uh, which you find a, a lot of cases on in particular with regard to social media. And then in the center there, you have the work it out idea. And I, and I really think this chart captures the idea. First Peter four and verse eight talks about that love co covers a multitude of sins. He's not saying there that we just overlook sin and, and don't count it. He, I think he's in that passage, he, he's really talking about the fact that God's love has covered our sins as we have turned from them and asked him to forgive us. It could also be in the sense that uh, we overlook one another's faults. 
the idiosyncrasies of, of, of our being and of who we are and so forth. But when we try to work it out, if that won't work, if we can't overlook it, they keep bothering us, then we need to talk. And, and Matthew 18 talks about dealing with uh, personal offenses where somebody has uh, sinned against you, you go talk to them, and you try to work it out with just them. And if that won't work, then you go get help and so forth. And so there really is, I think, the difference set for us. And here is the extreme on the right side of, well, you know, I'm not going to deal with it. I'm just going to put them down. I'm going to gossip about it. I'm going to tell everybody how bad I've been hurt and how everybody hurt. And they've never taken the moment, time, to sit and talk with somebody. You know, I just, I just have to tell you as a preacher, it's, it, 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 you have to have the, the, the hide of a rhinoceros, as they say, and you have to have the heart of a lion. You know, preachers are subjected to a lot of things that people have no clue about. I mean, uh, you know, people can say anything they want to to a preacher. And yet if he stops and says something to them, then Katie barred the door. You're in trouble. And so it's unfortunate. But uh, I, I'm not exactly sure why that is there in a lot of places, a lot of ways. Or they think that they can misrepresent things that you've said, but you can't defend yourself. And it's a, it's a hard place to be. I, I think there's a lot of that in the corporate world too, not with just preachers. I think there's a lot of that as well. So I want to just consider some passages with you uh, this evening and see if we can't not only um, see the difference between what a peacekeeper is and what a peacemaker is, but we can also see as the questionnaire asked me, uh, what are the qualities of a, of a peacemaker in terms of Matthew 5 and verse 9? And one of the first passages I, I thought of was 1 Peter 3 and verse 8. And that passage, uh, and I just, listen, these are just my notes. This is how I make, what you're seeing on the screen, I didn't have time to make and write out points and so forth. I was just thinking of, of, of different passages that came to mind. And generally what you're seeing on the screen is generally what my notes will look like when I'm up in the pulpit. I just have these verses written down as to what I want to talk about. I know the points I want to make about them. But in 1 Peter 3, beginning of verse 8, he said, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Get that. Get that. Get that. All of you have a unity of mind. That is a mind that is driving toward unity a mind that is filled with sympathy and brotherly love, a tender heart and a humble mind. Now, I ask you, I ask you, if, if, if that were who we were, if that's how we dealt with people uh, when we felt wronged or, or if we had that kind of heart, do you not think that that couldn't settle the issue, that we couldn't get it worked out? If both sides would have this sort of attitude, think about that. I'm going to read it again. Have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. What can't you fix between two brothers or two sisters who have this kind of disposition? There isn't anything you can't fix. I'm telling you. When you can't fix something, I'm going to tell you it's because you, you're lacking either one of these qualities or all of them. A unity of mind means we have a disposition of heart and mind toward the scriptures, toward God, toward being who he wants us to be. To have sympathy is to recognize that we could be wrong and that the other, if they're the one approaching me about something I've done wrong, they're coming to me out of a spirit of conviction and love and they want to help me do right. The idea of brotherly love is that we are family. We're God's family. And yes, we're going to have disagreements. Let's get real about that. But if we have this kind of attitude and heart, we can settle whatever disagreements we're going to have. I tell you, it's when somebody doesn't want to hear what the scripture says or doesn't want to do what the scripture says that we have problems. A tender heart. You know, you know what that means? That means that I'm going to look for ways that I can help the individual who has sinned save face. I'm not going to ask for my 
pound of cure. I'm not going to ask for my uh, pound of, of flesh. I, I'm going to have that tender heart and realize that, you know, I could have been wrong. I don't know who's writing on the charts here, uh, but uh, that's not me, just for the record. So when, when you look at that and understand what God has, has done to have that kind of heart, that, that looks for areas. You know, when, when people are upset with me, and especially because I've said something to them and confronted them about something, uh, you know, I, or because they misunderstood something I said, or maybe I did do something. I mean, I always try in my mind to look for a way to apologize or ask for forgiveness for something I've done wrong. You and I both know that when conflict arises between in relationships. There's usually enough fault to go around for everybody. And I think if we're tenderhearted enough to look for our own faults in it, even, even if we didn't instigate it, even if we weren't the, re, the, the party that inflicted the wound or rang the bell the first time, that's tenderheartedness. Then he says, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. So here, not only is our mental state addressed, but now how we're going to be proactive in getting this brought to some kind of resolution that is acceptable. And so you're going to have to be proactive. You're going to have to make sure that you're not trying to get one up on somebody. Or I'll show them. I'm not going to talk to them. I'm going to ignore them. I'm going to just revile them. I'm just going to, I'm going to tell everybody and walk away with my wounds and lick my wounds and let everybody know how miserable I am toward that person. That's what he's saying. Don't repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. Look what he says over in 1 Peter 2. He talks about Jesus. He said, for to this have you been called because Christ, verse 21, also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in turn, but he entrusted himself to him who judges righteously. God never wants us to retaliate in kind, and we have no grounds upon which we can retaliate in kind and be right with God. So when you talk about blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God, well, one of the things is, the characteristic of that is, I'm not going to try to get one up on somebody. I'm not going to try to pay back. The other thing I would say about that is uh, that sometimes, you know, you just, as best you can, you have to take some things just on the chin and go on and, and hope they all, you know, will eventually get settled. In some ways, that's being a peacekeeper, I, I suspect, but, but you're, the end result, you know, if you're just going to be a peacekeeper and that's all you're going to do is just go along to get along, never confront anything, you're never going to get the outcome of what peace is all about. The only way to get that is to be one who makes for peace, who seeks to do peace. And this is what he's talking about in this text. Now he turns in, in 1 Peter 3 and addresses or quotes from Psalms 34. That's in the next verse. And I want to read some more of Psalms 34 in a moment. But he said, whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil. You know, face it. I mean, I admit that most of the trouble that I've ever gotten myself into is because of my tongue. And I think it's true for most of us. And so here he starts out, let him keep his tongue from evil. A lot of times people talk about things they don't know what they're talking about. A lot of times they retaliate in kind and say bitter words and angry words that they, they wish they had never said later on. He said, let his lips uh, keep from speaking deceit. People lie sometimes. They're deceitful with their words. They won't be upfront with you. They're not transparent. And what he's saying is if you want to do good, if you want to enjoy life and see good days, then this is what you need to do. And he said, let him turn away from evil and do good. Notice how many times good is in this passage. Let him seek peace and pursue it. You know, the point that he's making here 
the point that he's making here is that the good that we enjoy goes hand in hand with the good that we do and the peace that we seek and the peace that we pursue. So if you want to love life, want to see good days, then it's going to have to be commensurate with the good that you seek and the peace that you seek and the peace that you pursue. In other words, you're not going to enjoy life if you're going to be miserable, make everybody miserable around you, if you're going to hold grudges and hold it in, and every time I see that person, I'm just going to steer at them, walk away, and just be that way. It's not helpful, folks. It's not helpful to you. It's not helpful to your relationship with your brother or sister in the Lord. What he's telling us is that the, the good life is, is, is only going to be achieved. As I said, it goes hand in hand with the good and the peace that we seek and pursue. The good you enjoy may never come from the outcome of the good that you do or the peace that you seek or pursue. It, it, the outcome may not be there. You may never get the outcome from the good that you're seeking or the peace that you're pursuing, but in your heart of hearts and, in, and as you pillow your head at night, you can know that I have tried to do good and there is a peace in your heart. There is a peace in your heart. Do you think that Jesus thought that everybody loved him when he was here upon the earth? Do you think that Jesus didn't think that people were going around lying about him, saying things about him that were not right, or the apostles? But as much as lies within them, as Paul would say in Romans 12, be at peace with all men. You do everything that you can. And then he says in verse 11, let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. I tell you, we need to check ourselves when we, when we are at odds with, with one another because the, the Lord always hears our prayers except for those who want to do evil. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are always open to their prayers. Who are the righteous? The righteous are those who would love life and see good days, who are keeping their tongue from evil and, keep, and, and their lips from speaking deceit and who are turning away from evil and trying to do good and who are seeking peace. And That's the righteous, folks. But the face of the Lord is against those who are contemplating evil, holding grudges and that sort of thing. Go over to, with me for just a moment to Psalms 34. This is, this is a beautiful uh, psalm. It's no doubt, it is so David-esque. So you know that David wrote it, even if you don't read the caption ahead of it, you could just tell. And you could think about David's life and imagine uh, why David writes this. In Psalms 34, and I'm going to read starting at verse 8. Uh, and uh, actually, i tell you what I'm going to do. I know it's not like you've got somewhere to go. We're... we're until tomorrow, we're still sheltered in place. So you haven't got anywhere to go. So I'm going to read Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their prayer, their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their trouble. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. 
Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not a one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of them who take refuge in him will be condemned. You know what is so beautiful about that psalm and Peter quoting it in 1 Peter? The context of both of those are almost the same. I mean, they're both during times of provocation and persecution. No doubt David is running from Saul or trying to, to escape from Saul who's trying to kill him. And he's writing these things about that and maybe some other extenuating circumstances with Abimelech and, and uh, uh, the other uh, uh, kings that he had sought refuge from and so forth, but that he was being mistreated is the point. He's being persecuted. First Peter is a, one of the books of the Bible that's about persecution. And it's in 1 Peter 3, actually in verse 15, that we have the real key to dealing with persecution. When he said, sanctify the Lord God in your heart always. In other words, set God apart in your heart. Set God in your heart as the king of your life. That's what he's saying. If you want to deal with persecution, make God, the, put, put the throne of God right in your heart. Let him rule your heart. And that's how we're going to deal with persecution. And that's what he's saying here. I cried to the Lord, he heard me. I mean, just, just listen to that wonderful psalm. Now, when you think about, and you know, the thing is, David having written this psalm, David in first, and we're going to look at these passages real quick in 1 Samuel 24, 26, uh, uh, 24 and chapter 26. Uh, this is where he's running from Saul. This is where he's hiding out in the caves and so forth. But, but what is significant about these passages that I'm giving you is that he's quoting the very principles that he wrote about in Psalm 34 to his men. First Psalms, I mean, first, Sam, first Samuel, the 24th chapter, and beginning at verse 7, listen to David tell his men. So David persuaded his men with these words, and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. He had heard, he had said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put my hand against him, seeing he is, Lord's, he is the Lord's anointed. Now look over in, in 1 Samuel 26 this time, and in verse 9 we have almost the same thing on another occasion. But David said to Abisha, do not destroy him, for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And David said, as the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him. What did David pray in Psalm 34? That the Lord would punish the wicked and the evil. He said, the Lord will strike him or his day will come to die, or he will go down into battle and perish. And you know what happened to Samuel? He went down into battle and perished. David trusted in God. Now, the last passage I want to look at are, is in verse 23. And this is, this I think, is really the key passage in which he says in 1 Samuel 26 and 23, the Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put out my hand against the Lord's anointing. That was his words to Saul. Listen, he's saying to him, I have every right to take your life, but I have a love for God that pushes me beyond the fact that I'm going to ask for my rights. Great lesson for us today. And here's why. I am really tired of hearing people talk about their individual rights and about this shelter in place thing and about this, uh, all that. You know, I don't understand all of it either. But the reality of it is, is it is for the safety of people that we have been asked to do this. And I'm tired of people, and especially hearing Christians complain about it. There's no excuse for it. I, I don't like it, but I'm not going to complain about it. It is what it is, and, and they're trying to save lives. Can you not appreciate that? It's not about your rights anyway. I mean, I get tired of hearing Christians talk about their, their rights are being violated. That these conspiracy theories that are out there about the COVID-19 and all that stuff, and our rights are being taken away and we're going to be taken over by the communists tomorrow. I am tired of hearing that. He that wants to love life, let him do good. 
let him seek peace and pursue it. And that's how we get through it. All right, I'm off my soapbox, as my friend Matthew Conley would say. I'm going to quit there because I'll start preaching. The last passage I want to look at is James, the third, ch uh, the third chapter. And in James, the third chapter, uh, James also makes mention there of, you know, again, you know where he starts in James 3? Look at verse 5. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. You know, it just takes a spark to start a forest on fire. And your tongue can be that spark. And so he starts with the tongue there, doesn't he? And talk about how we misuse our tongue in talking about people and about brothers and, and so forth and so on. He says, uh, for every kind of beast and bird, of bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It, you can't domesticate the tongue. You can control it in the sense that you're going to do what God said is the only way. That's really his point. He's not, no human can do it. But you're going to have to depend upon God, and you're going to have to look for good, and you're going to have to seek peace and pursue it. You want to know what the characteristics of a peacemaker are. That's what they are. But keep reading with me down, starting verse 13. He said, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. You know, meekness of wisdom. I, I love that term. Meekness is the ability to bear up under pressure with a smile. You know, a lot of people can deal with pressure. A lot of people can deal with hard times, but they don't do it very, very nicely. They want to rant and rave. They want to cuss and throw things and get mad. And, you know, I'll tell you, I, I listen to people and see it on Twitter and other social media, Facebook. And, and I think to myself, these are first world problems. Do you not think about the poor leper over in India that drags his, his limbs with him wherever he goes and they're half eaten up and he's begging for money? Do you not see the people in third world countries that are, are, don't have clean water to drink. And we complain about our water when it doesn't get hot fast enough. I mean, do we not understand the blessings that we have? And so he said, who is wise and understanding among you by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast and be false to the truth. Do you get that? Don't be false to the truth. Don't be spreading gossip. Don't be spreading malicious rumors. Don't be uh, spreading conspiracy theories about this or about that. Don't be false to the truth. Let me tell you a, a real simple point about this. If you find somebody that can be false to the truth, when you find somebody that, that, that can be false to the truth, you have found a person that there isn't anything they wouldn't do under the right circumstances or under the wrong circumstances, maybe I should say, if it served their purpose. And that's what he's saying. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, if it's about you and it's about your agenda, if that's who you are and that's what it's about, he said, quit it. Don't be false to the truth. He said, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above. Remember how he started, James? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth liberally and upbraideth not. And so what he's saying in essence is, you haven't prayed for wisdom if you're going to behave in this way. Pray for wisdom. He said, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, where one has a personal agenda about something, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Think about that. That's why I said, when somebody falls to the truth, there isn't anything under, the, under certain circumstances they wouldn't do. There's every vile practice. You've opened yourself up. I'm not saying you're going to do everything vile that's, that's, that, that you could do. 
but you are opening yourself up to being vile and engaging in every vile practice there is once you lie against the truth, once you're false to the truth. Our credibility as Christians is so important to this world that we cannot shine our lights without the truth. And when we are engaging in conspiracy theories and, and rumors and gossiping and, and saying things that we shouldn't say, our light's going out. There's just a dimness to and a dullness to our Christianity. But verse 17 gives us the beauty and closes the picture. But, and I'm always thankful for that word, but, because here's the contrast. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be the way I just described. But the wisdom from above is first pure. It's transparent, has no hidden agenda. Not trying to accomplish something behind somebody's back. It's not sneaking around here doing this or that. It's pure. It is what it is, and, and there's no mistaking it for what it is. You don't have to worry about it. The wisdom that comes from God is pure. It's transparent. We're not trying to trap somebody into something. We're not trying to trick somebody into something. And then he said it's peaceable. There's that word. It's peaceable. It, it's pursuing peace. It's looking for peace. It's not looking for a fight. It's not looking for an argument. It's looking for peace. It's gentle, gentle. Uh, you know, and here's a struggle. I, I'll just tell you, it's a struggle sometimes because there, there's no easy way to tell somebody that they're wrong and that they're going to necessarily like it at, at that moment. Now, I think later on, if they think about it and realize, hey, even if I was wrong in saying that you're wrong, you're going to say, well, you know, he came to me and tried to, he, he thought I was, and he tried to help me. At least that, that's what I try to do for people, and I think most people are that way. Or if you were wrong, you're going to say, man, he really is a friend. He cared enough about me to say something. Listen, the best friend you can be to somebody sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, is to confront them because that's what peacemakers do. They're trying to, to, to get people out of sin to correct the outward act as well as give the right kind of heart to that individual, the outer and the inner, to stop the kind of thinking that leads to sin, the kind of practice that leads to sin, that begins in the heart, out of the abundance of the heart. Every evil proceeds from the heart, Jesus said. So we're trying to correct both the outer action and, and transform the inner heart of man. He says it's peaceable. Gentle, and here's the other, open to reason. He's approachable. Can be talked with. And he doesn't throw, or she doesn't throw cold water on it. They're open to reason. They're full of mercy and good fruits impartial. They treat everybody the same. Black and white, red and brown, old and young, rich and poor. They're impartial. And then here it is. They're sincere. I'll tell you what. Sincerity can make up for a lot of deficiencies in our life if we can get across to somebody that we're sincere. You know, the word sincere is an interesting word that means really without wax. When they would sell pottery and so forth in the first century, if it was cracked, they would fill it full of wax and, and try to pass it off as being, you know, uncracked. And, and maybe they did. Maybe they sold it to seconds then. I don't know. But anyway, they were, it's the way they had to pass. So sincerity meant without wax. I mean, there's no hiddenness here. There's not just an attempt to deceive anybody about anything. This is what it is. It's sincere. This is, this, is, this is it. And then listen to what he says. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Who make peace. Not keep peace. Make peace. 
And that is that they make every effort in their own life first to be at peace with all men. One last thought, and the lesson is yours. When you go over to Matthew, the fifth chapter, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. If you noticed in Matthew 5, in that same opening there, in that same Sermon on the Mount, that sons of God is used in one other place in that same context. And that is in the context of those who would, what? Misuse you, despitefully use you. And what does Jesus uh, say about that in, in Matthew, the, seventh, uh, the fifth chapter, rather? And toward the end of the chapter, he said, You've heard it said, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, do you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For while we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. We are never more like God than when we seek peace with our enemies and when we learn to forgive. Forgiveness is at the very heart of who God is. It ought to be at our heart that we might be peacemakers, the sons of God. Thanks for listening. Appreciate your attention. Appreciate your time. And hope that these things have helped. psalm before closing comments and prayer will be savior lead me lest i stray <clears throat> savior lead me lest i stray gently lead me all the way I am saved when by thy side, I would in thy love abide. Lead me, lead me, Savior, lead me lest I stray. Gently down the stream of time, lead me, Savior, all the way. Thou, the refuge of my soul, when life's stormy billows roll, I am safe when thou art nigh. All my hopes on thee rely. Lead me, lead me. Savior, lead me lest I stray. Gently down the stream of time, lead me, Savior, all the way. Savior, lead me then at last, when the storm of life is past. To the land of endless day, where all tears are wiped away. Lead me, lead me, Savior, lead me, lest I stray. Down the stream of time, lead me, Savior, all the way.
I think we can say that it's been a wonderful day being able to just enjoy the beauty of the day and coming together like this to praise our great God in song, study his word, remember our Savior Jesus, what he did for us, and encourage each other to continue to walk in his ways. Appreciate Matthew and leading us in song this day and tonight without the, uh, the help of his family behind him. Great job, Matthew. Thank you. Appreciate uh, Bill, his message on being the peacemakers and the peacekeepers that the Lord would have us to be as his humble servants as we pass through this life. I think he gave us a lot of things to ruminate on, meditate on, think about as we seek to be those peacemakers in this world that many times is not very peaceful as we look around our uh, our world today certainly hope all you mothers had a had a blessed day please continue to keep uh, helen and gt in your prayers gt says that helen loves the cards that she gets so um brethren please keep those cards going to our sister helen Keep Bob in your prayers and Sister Graceland and others that maybe I'm not remembering at this time. Again, I mentioned this morning we are um, going to be working towards um, being able to reassemble in the building um, three weeks from today on the 31st. Sunday the 31st, if the Lord tarries and all goes well. Um, a lot of things are going to have to go on to make that happen, to happen safely and, and properly and well. So keep our leaders, our nation's leaders in your prayers. Keep us in your prayers as we seek to do the things that will be right and helpful and, and good. Don't forget Bill's uh, class on Job that will begin Tuesday morning, 9 o'clock. Um, looking forward to that, looking forward to seeing many people as we come together to learn from that great book of the Old Testament. Let's not forget, even though we're in this kind of strange situation right now, our mission, our goal, take Christ to the world, take Christ to Montgomery, every opportunity we have, pray for opportunities to, to share the the blessed, wonderful news of the gospel, the hope of a home in heaven with our great God forever and ever. And if the Lord tarries, we'll meet again 7 o'clock on Wednesday night when Brother Matthew Conley will continue in the, uh, the great book of Acts as we see Paul start off on his first missionary journey. Hope to Hope, to, hope that many of you can engage in that study with Brother Matthew. As we close tonight, I'd like to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 and 24, before Brother Willie Washington leads us in our closing prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, now may to the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. And trust in the Lord. He's returning, maybe this very night, to take us home. Let us be those peacemakers as we await for his return. Brother Willie, would you please lead us in closing prayer? Let us pray. Father, we thank thee for the blessing of being able to gather to worship thee from the safety of our own homes. Please be with Helen as she has had an extended illness. Strengthen her. Be with her family, especially GT. We pray also, Father, for Bob and Graceland and others of our number. 
Please protect us from the virus. Be with our leaders, our president, our governors, mayors, and others who are making important decisions regarding our health. Comfort the thousands of families around the world who have lost loved ones to the virus. Father, we're thankful for thy son and thy spirit. Help us to rejoice evermore, to pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. When we encounter temptation, help us to find the way of escape that you provide. Please forgive us when we repent. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.